I thought we could talk about worship and possibly look at what it means to worship. And I'm sure that possibly to some extent we would all say that we know what worship is. But I just wondered if maybe if we dug just a little bit deeper, if there might be differing views for people about worship, possibly based on our cultural backgrounds, what worship might look like to us. I won't be speaking for very long today, but I'd like us to just take a look at some areas surrounding worship, possibly what, what is worship, who is it for, and how it should be done. Now the Oxford Dictionary explains it as the feeling or expression of reverence and adoration for a deity. In Wikipedia, it says that worship is an act of religious devotion, usually directed towards a deity, so that's a god. It goes on further to say that worship, an act of worship, may be performed individually in an informal or formal group or by a designated leader. Now, in the New Testament, in, well, the Greek word that's most commonly used for worship, it's called proskuneo. I think that's how it's pronounced. And it means to bow down or fall down. So I suppose that we could say that for the most part, worship requires some kind of action or response. Would you agree? Yeah. And I think that though we do it corporately on a Sunday, worship is still a personal thing. It's still an individual thing. Because as with other things in our lives, we can choose whether or not to do it, can't we? But who is it for? So Luke 4, 8 tells us where Jesus replied, the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. So from that we can say worship is for God, it is to God and only him. And so all reason for worshiping should be born out of the truth of who he really is. And I suppose, difficult as it is, and I mean difficult, I'm talking from experience, all worship should not be based on how we're feeling each day. So if I get up out of bed on the wrong side this morning, it shouldn't be the case that God should not be glorified for giving me a new day. Or maybe the fact that I'm going through what might seem like hell at the moment. You know, though in my head, that is justification. That's the reason, actually. It shouldn't be justification not to praise God. Would you agree? So it shouldn't be based on our feelings. We're thinking about, oh, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm just really down in the valley right now. I'm not in the place where I want to be. But that still doesn't change the fact about who God is. So therefore, I would say that all worship of God should be driven by all love for him. So because we love, we then worship. Is that fair? So if we think then, so how, how should it be done? How should worship be done? The book of John, 
chapter 4, verse 23 to 24, says this. But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit. So those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. But what does that mean? Mm. My view on that, the, the word spirit, well, it, it, it refers to what's happening on our insides, yeah? So, in a sense, it encompasses our mind, the soul, the heart, all that's going on in here. And I, to worship in spirit is about coming with a sincere and grateful heart. A heart that exudes love for our Creator. True worship is about acknowledging God. I mean, it, even in, in, in everything that we do, really. But that might be difficult if we don't truly know God for ourselves. You see, we might know of Him. But if we have not truly experienced him in our lives on a personal level, it can be hard to worship. See, as a child, and even into my early teens, I'd always gone to church, like it or not, because you were made to go to church. And... We were given the facts of John 3.16 about how God loved the world and he sent his son to die on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. We heard that. I held on to that. And I can say I, I believed that. So therefore, I knew about God. Would you agree? You know about God then, yeah? Yeah. This is what he's done. This is what it says. You hold on to that. Even when I gave up church for the club, I still knew about God. Didn't stop me from doing what I wanted to do. Living my life the way that I wanted. I still knew about him. Then years later, I accepted Jesus as my personal savior. So I could say, I now know God. Because now I know about the things that he's done. I've got that relationship. I I've, I've, could look back on my life and see how things have changed the way that he's worked things out. I mean, obviously, the relationship is not perfect from my end because as we all do, we're still, we still mess up, yeah? But then it doesn't change the fact that the creator of the universe knows, knows me, knows you, loves me, loves you, sent his son to die, and for me, that's, that's just mind-blowing. It absolutely is. The fact that I didn't have to earn, I didn't have to earn it. I could never earn it anyway. But I had to receive it. So knowing it and receiving it 
two different things. It needs, it requires a response. I was thinking about this, and I mean, just a simple analogy. Um, I don't know why it just popped in my, in my head. Um, in a work context where, as you do, you're there typing away, you get that notification, email pops up. Yeah, I know it's there. I'm not opening it yet because I'm, I'm not ready for it. I've, I've got other things that I need to be getting on with. Someone who's sitting across from me, she's, in a sense, waiting on that, waiting for me to have a look at that. She says, oh, yeah, did you get that? Yeah, I know that it's there. I just haven't opened it. I just haven't read it. I mean, it's a simple thing, but in a sense, it's that thing of knowing that God is there until we accept, receive. It's like opening up this gift that he has given to us then that's when we can then fully enter into that relationship with him. So for me, it's, you know, it's just an absolute privilege to be able to say, thank you, God. Because I, I somehow think that it's quite difficult to know and accept this truth and not feel immense gratitude. Gratitude that would in a sense, well, it's not force, but the gratitude that would make you be in awe of him. I find that quite difficult. But like I said, getting to that point of knowing and experiencing this truth does require a response and an action on our part. I mean, it involves confessing our sins, accepting Jesus as our Savior, being baptized. Through studying and reading his word, through acknowledging that what he's doing in our lives, recognition of his blessings, by way, or families, jobs, in all the things that from day to day, we should acknowledge God's hand at work in our lives. So the more we know about God and the more we recognize his presence in our lives, the more we grow to love him and to appreciate him. And the more we love and appreciate, then the better we'll get at worshiping him. So what constitutes this worship? For some people, it might mean singing, shouting, dancing. For others, it might mean falling before God, crying, speaking out in tongues, or sitting quietly and reflecting. It might mean praying or meditating on scripture. I'm not sure how many, well, how many, or if any, one here um, had seen that there was a series on Channel 5, Bad Habit Holy Orders? Yeah? yeah? yeah. Right, my brother. <laughs> and it's about, I think, five kind of wayward young ladies, young ladies, um, I can't remember, maybe ranging from age 19 to 22 or somewhere thereabout, but... Despite looking, you know, they were having the time of their lives, they would go out clubbing and partying, all the things that I used to do when I was, you know, back in the day. Um, but somehow they felt that there was something missing from their lives, and they decided to embark on a spiritual journey, which brought them to a nunnery. Yeah, some of them got the shock of their lives because they didn't know that's where they would end up. So they were made to ditch the social media 
they had to get rid of the makeup and they had to dress modestly. Some of them didn't have, as you probably can imagine, they didn't have anything that would be uh, modest. So hence, the nuns provided. They were woken at maybe 12 or 2 in the morning to go and pray, obviously under duress. And just to get involved in various activities, one, and in the weeks to follow, they sent them to different, different nunneries. And one that they stayed in had some um, African nuns. And they had a session where these nuns, oh my gosh, they were dancing and clapping and getting down, just as we see our African brothers and sisters here. So we know that they, you know, they know how to do it. And that was a shock to them. I mean, a shock to me as well, because I've, I wouldn't, you kind of wouldn't expect that. But that was their way of doing their worship. Then they next moved on to another one. I think they're called the Carmelite nuns, where they just prayed. And they walked around in silence for hours on end. And this was a struggle for the young ladies. One of them actually described it as being in hell. But the thing that one of the nuns said, she said, you know, there's just so much going on in the world. We have to pray. So they're like intercessors. And I mean, this, this just telling you, kind of for the sake of telling you, but just to say, you know, there's differing ways of coming to God. And some will be more preferable to others. But when we worship from the heart, there is no right or wrong way. We worship as led by the Spirit of God. You know, sometimes when we, when we gather here on a, on a Sunday morning um, for rehearsing or worship session, and things go wrong. Sometimes things go wrong, and it's so easy to get a bit flustered and, you know, self-conscious because it's hard enough, trust me, it's hard enough being up here when things are going okay. So you don't need the added pressure of, you know, something not going the way that you kind of expected it or the way that you kind of planned it. But I tend to try to remind myself, and, you know, I'll say this to the others as well, you know, as long as what we're doing is coming from the heart. God's not going to be sitting there going, oh, well, that's a bit rubbish. He won't. Do you know? He will accept our worship because we're doing it to him, for him. It's not about us, and it should never be about us because true worship must be God-focused. And I know that it can be easy, you know, in our corporate worship to get caught up with the songs that we sing or the way that we should worship or the different components that should make up the worship session. But while some aspects of these are necessary because we do need structure and the whole like, but if focusing on this then becomes a hindrance to fully engaging with the Spirit of God, then we're kind of missing the point. Sadly, we're kind of missing the point. So in as much as I love music and I love to dance and I love to sing and the whole jumping about, and for me that is, in a sense, that's how I worship. I'm not a uh, sit quietly and that kind of doesn't really work much for me, but like I said, it's how we worship when we're worshiping from the heart. But in as much as I love music and the whole dance and thing, the music by itself is not worship. So true worship is not about the songs that we sing or whether we stand or we sit or we use drums or we clap our hands or we just be silent. It's about intimacy with God. Intimacy. And even when we're worshiping corporately, as we do on Sunday mornings, 
it can still be an individual thing because we do have a choice whether we want to engage or not. We can come and just decide, well, I'm just going to stand around and I can't be bothered. I'm just here because I've just come here. So we know that God is omnipresent and we can worship him all the time wherever we are. But I dare say that sometimes, you know, when we come to church, we, it requires conscious effort. Sometimes we need to make that conscious effort to engage with the spirit and not just go through the motions of, you know, relying on the external stimuli that might be produced by the music or whatever else is going on. Do you know, oftentimes, sometimes we're saying, okay, did you come expectant this morning? What did you come expecting this morning? Mm. That I'm going to engage with the Spirit of God. I need, to, I need to connect. It's like making that connection with His Spirit. Because when we do that, it, then it's, it, it takes you to another level. David spoke to his son, to Solomon, and said to him, Learn to know the God of your ancestors intimately. Worship and serve him with your whole heart and a willing mind. For the Lord sees every heart and knows every plan and thought. Learn to know the God of your ancestors intimately. Worship and serve him with your whole heart and a willing mind. For the Lord sees every heart and knows every plan and thought. Do you know, one of the best Sunday club sessions I think I've had, going back maybe, maybe two years, was when we looked at Psalm 139 about God knowing everything about us. He knows when you get up, he knows when you go out, you can't hide from him. And I had the kids take turn to read verses and then we just talked about what it meant. Then we had some extended discussions around the fact that, yeah, God knows what we're going to say even before we say it. We can't go anywhere to hide from him. He sees everything that we do. And this sparked some really, really interesting conversations with the children we had miss so if I go inside and I close my door and the roof is on will he still see me yes he will still see you then lots of hands going up and lots of questions yes he will even in the shower yes he will still see you and this was them covering themselves the look on their faces then the million dollar question, which I'm sure everybody else was waiting to ask, but no one was brave enough. Even when I'm doing a poo? <laughs> yes. Ew. He sees you. He sees everything. Kids, uh, you have to love them. You really, really have to love them. And I was struck that the other day I was... Barry and I were going somewhere. We're talking. We didn't have any children with us. We probably were going to go pick one of them up. And as you do, we were talking about the kids. And I was saying, you know, um, how, you know, for instance, Brianna just cracks me up because she's quite funny. And, you know, what a joy they bring to us. And the fact that the nine years that we were together before we had Brianna, I wouldn't trade them for what I have now for the past 17 years because they just bring so much joy and everything into your life. And I said to him, you know what? God knew what he was doing, you know, when he gave us children. I think he really knew what he was doing because, you know, they just change your lives and make things. And then it kind of struck me. I said, That's the same thing we do. God is our father, and he loved, and despite what we go through, I mean, you look at, well, apologies for those who might not yet have children, but maybe you can bear with me, or you might have nieces or nephews or whatever. But the fact that they bring so much joy into our lives, 
we know that there is the other side as well where they do give us a bit of heartache, etc. sometimes, and we are not perfect parents. And they spin that around in the light of we are children of God. And God looks down on us with such love. And that's the, 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 the um, when I looked at it, it's like it just pinged. The way that you're feeling about your children, when God looks down, he feels, he feels even more about us as his children. So, hence the reason why he sent his son. So because of Christ's death on the cross, we have the freedom and the privilege to enter into the presence of a holy and righteous God. One who sees, he knows everything about us, yet he loves us unconditionally. So let us just be real with him, yeah? Let's be real with him. There are so many things that can distract us when we're trying to engage with God. So many things. Oh, what am I going to cook when I go home later? Some of you might actually be sitting there thinking that as well. What do I wear tomorrow? Mm, should I do the ironing? You know, all this. No, <laughs> not today. <laughs> Are you still thinking about it, though? <laughs> you know, there's so much head noise. So much head noise. But the challenge is, let us not just go through the motions and just do it for the sake of doing it. Because you know what? Even if others can't see it, God sees. Jeremiah 17 says, 17.10 tells us, the Lord searches our hearts and examines our secret motives. Bluntly put, he sees through hypocrisy and he doesn't like it. So let us ask our Heavenly Father to help us to shut out the head noise and help us to remain focused on him. It's a challenge. For me, that's a big challenge. When we come to worship in whatever form that may take and wherever, wherever we choose to do it, let us humble ourselves before God. Let us allow him to examine our hearts and to highlight and remove anything that will hinder us from giving ourselves fully to him. That is when we'll then be able to freely worship him in the spirit and truth. I'll be quiet for a few minutes and just allow you if you need to make your own responses to God. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.